Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for coming along. It's great to see so many of you here tonight in this wonderful venue. Um, so this is our first independent minds event we've ever run, and it's with Simon Calder tonight. Ask Simon Calder. <laughs> Such a warm welcome. Um, I'm Cathy Adams, and this is my colleague Helen Coffey. We're going to be debating with Simon a couple of the, well, very important travel issues of the day. So on the agenda, we've got what's new in 2018, what's going to be new for 2019, Brexit, of course, and then security and risk. So if you do have any questions, please leave them right till the end. It's going to be in four different parts, so just wait till the end with your question. We look forward to hearing them then. Okay, enjoy. Let's kick off. Thank you very much indeed, everybody, for coming along. Um, you're all very welcome indeed. And uh, it's a, a real pleasure to talk to some of you beforehand. And I hope I, we will be able to talk to the rest of you afterwards when, thank goodness, we'll all be able to get a drink. Can't wait. Um, so, yes, as, as Cathy uh, said, we're going to spin through uh, what, uh, what has been happening First of all, um, in 2018, and what a year it's been in travel. Just to give you a little bit of background so you can understand how Helen and Cathy and I work together, this is the uh, travel desk, apparently. <laughs> I, I'm, luckily enough, I never go there um, because I'm um, uh, on holiday pretending to work which I can assure you is much, much better than working in an office. Um, there we are. Uh, so this was um, uh, the Blue Lagoon in, um, in uh, just off the coast of Malta, which was lovely. Then I had to go to, uh, uh, where, anybody want to guess where this is? Bruges. Uh, not Bruges. Uh, where, where else? Munich. No, not Munich. No, I, I'd stay on the Bruges theme, but... Brussels. Brussels, yes, the Grand Place. I had to taste some beer there. It was hell. Um, <laughs> Uh, then um, go on a uh, fly drive holiday in Cuba. Um, yep, and uh, no prizes for guessing where this is. So while, while my excellent colleagues are um, uh, keeping the travel desk going, I'm drifting round Sydney Harbour being massaged by lovely Nadine while talking nonsense to a camera. It is, ladies and gentlemen, a tough life, but someone has to do it. Um, and this... Uh, this, by the way, isn't what you're thinking. Um, this was a long time ago. I went to a, a Guardian event. There was simply no atmosphere. <laughs> so, um, so we're going to spin through the, uh, the, the past and uh, the, the very near past and the uh, present and the future. So the great thing is, um, I don't know if any of you have the good fortune to uh, pretend to work in travel media, but Ryanair is the gift that keeps on giving. They've given us so far, I'm just going back to January, they've given us two different um, luggage policies to try to explain on the cabin baggage you can bring on two planes. So that's a good start to the year. Um, February, actually really good news, which is that people could go back to uh, Tunisia, which um, after three years of being off, limits because of the Foreign Office advice it was a very good thing. And then, um, in, also in uh, March, I went to uh, Palma in Mallorca and was confronted by this. Of course, over-tourism, a very serious issue. Um, China, which, by the way, as you probably know, is going to become the biggest inbound destination, is sort of gearing up for it. Who's been to the Great Wall? OK, right, so 40% of you. Well, it's incredibly crowded, isn't it? Um, and so when I was there, I saw they were actually building new bits. There we are. Um, and um, then uh, the beast from the east. Of course, you've probably forgotten that, but this was Glasgow Airport closed down. Everything went horribly wrong. Um, and the bad weather, or possibly the um, adjusted climate changed weather, has been a... Uh, an absolute menace all year with them. Um, this was the thunderstorms just one day in August causing absolute havoc. Um, that didn't stop the very first non-stop flight from London to Australia, which uh, my excellent colleagues allowed me to travel on in um, economy class. And there's a clue here. <laughs> there's a clue here, which is flight closing um, goes at 1.15. Uh, 12.48 was the time that picture was taken. And that's why you should always be last on the plane. 
I got on board, I walked down to economy, I thought, right, it's two seats together there, and I just went and sat down. And that's the way to do it if you're going to be on a plane for 18 hours. Um, this, by the way, wasn't me, but it just shows um, there's, there's lots of problems with um, very long haul flights. The first one is the carbon footprint, which is far heavier than it would be for if you were making a three-stop trip to Australia in the olden days. Um, I don't suppose anybody here is old enough to remember it used to take three hops. So you go to somewhere in the Gulf to Singapore typically or maybe Bangkok and then on to Australia. Well, that's far gentler on the environment than going non-stop. Also, um, well, if you subscribe to the Jean-Paul Sartre uh, theory that hell is other people, your fellow passengers are more likely to co cause a problem on a very long flight. Anyway, I made it, and the extraordinary thing is those prices, so £679 return to Sydney or Melbourne, that's what we were paying in the 1980s. It's absolutely absurd, but um, great time to be a traveller. Of course, you might think, well, I'm not catching a plane because they're um, bad for the environment. I'm going to go by train, and we also saw in April the very first uh, non-stop, not non-stop, direct, forgive me, uh, train from London to Amsterdam, well it said Amsterdam, but actually the key places that it, it was taking you to were Rotterdam, which is absolutely gorgeous, and uh, that's in the wrong place, most definitely. That's <laughs> crikey. Uh, let's see what happens here. Oh, well, that was lucky. Um, th this, this is The Hague. So anybody can get to Amsterdam. It's the easiest place in the world to get to. We have more flights from London than, than um, to any other uh, non British Isles place, and I'll use that advisedly. Um, so it's really easy, and I actually went out on the train and came back flying, and it was a dead heat. Um, but uh, that was timing it from St Pancras back to, uh, out to uh, Amsterdam Central and back from there. So the planes are sort of slightly quicker, but going to Rotterdam, going to The Hague is much, much easier by train. Oh, then... There were some free drinks on Ryanair if you were lucky enough on Grand National Day to be at Liverpool Airport. Were you? No. Ah, OK. <laughs> so uh, th this man um, won had just won half a million pounds because his horse won the Grand National. And so he said, right, um, after everyone had been kept waiting for half an hour, because apparently if you're the, the, the Grand National winning jockey and you're from Ireland, you have to fly back on Ryanair. Anyway, Michael O'Leary bought everybody a drink. Terms and conditions applied. Um, uh, lots of problems with air traffic control through the years. Staff shortages um, in Mannheim. Honestly, it's been, it has contributed to a really bad year. And, of course, plenty of surveys around, such as Ryanair's main base, Stansted, worst airport in the world, or not. Surveys and travel are um, made for each other. Um, Heathrow, uh, absolutely nothing has happened in terms of the third runway all year. Um, we, th there has simply been no movement on it at all. Um, the only thing which has happened that's relevant in uh, Heathrow is that they had a fantastic auction of Terminal 1, all the bits inside it. It was a fascinating event. But when the, the sign there saying Terminal 1 was going for £1,000, I made my excuses and left. Um, and then Gatwick suddenly came out and said, oh, yes, we, we, this is, this is the, um, the Blue Peter approach to runways. Here's one we prepared earlier. <laughs> In 1979, in fact, it's the standby runway, and they just said, actually, we've worked out a way we can run the two together. So quite possibly, given that, for reasons we may discuss in the future, in the very near future to do with Brexit, nothing else is happening, it may be that this is the solution to all our woes. Um, a real highlight, um, Russia 2018, um, for FIFA, for all its many sins, and Russia for all its many, many sins, um, got together and, and FIFA said, you can't have the World Cup unless you people let people in without all your ridiculous visa rules, fingerprinting, photographs, going to embassies and consulates and everything. Um, and so all you needed to do was buy a ticket for any old match. I bought one for Croatia against Nigeria in Kaliningrad. Cost 80 quid, less than a visa. It took five minutes to fill in the form. And say what you like about Vladimir Putin. Oh, um, and by the way, during the... Uh, 
uh, World Cup, we saw prices as low as £109 for a week's package holiday. Say what you like about um, Vladimir Putin, and I dare say we will, but on the night of the final in Russia, in, in Moscow, he suddenly said, right, anybody who had a World Cup ticket, you can come back to Russia anytime you want to before the end of the year. Just show your fan ID and we'll welcome you in. And it works. I was there earlier this month pretending to work in Vladimir and uh, Nizhny Novgorod. And lovely it was too. Um, <laughs> of course, Salisbury, which my excellent colleague Helen has recently visited and written about, uh, this is a tweet from Have I Got News For You. Um, there we are, just to... Uh, it may possibly have been tampered with. Um, uh, uh, um, anyway, uh, then we've had so many, so many failures um, of airlines. There we are. We had one week, Primera Air was promising to get you to uh, New York on a non-stop plane, which didn't work. That was a, that, that's an artist's impression of a plane they would have if they were still going, uh, but they're not, because uh, of course they went pop. It was only last month, beginning of uh, October, they went bust. Um, other airlines are available. Um, wow Air, anybody flown on Wow Air? Oh, okay, good, um, I heard good things about it, but not from the accountants. Um, and they have last night, well, they arrived in the early hours of this morning, they flew four of their aircraft out of Iceland um, and return them to the lessors, which is never a good look if that's one-fifth of your fleet. Big meeting on Friday in Reykjavik. Things might happen there. And Cobalt Air, no, probably nobody here flew on Cobalt Air because they're only going for 10 minutes. Um, anyway, they, they went bust. <laughs> there we are. And Flybee, of course, are still going, but um, up for sale. And who knows what's going to happen there? Certainly not me. And everybody, I think, has been on a Boeing 767. And the great news is... They're not going to be around for much longer. This is British Airways' last 767 flight. Terrible planes, very slow, very inefficient, um, rather like me, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> but I did get sent because, um, obviously, Helen and Cathy thought, who can we send to the last ever 1830 holiday? <laughs> um, so I, I went along, and um, it was, it was a, a sad, sad time, but um, possibly Magaluf will be uh, the better for it. Um, and then trains, they've just been terrible all year, haven't they? Um, there we had the uh, lines shredded. This was two weeks ago, I think, although it's difficult to tell because all the disruption merges into one. Um, all, all terrible. And this, I think, sums up the year for rail passengers. Um, absolutely dreadful. So uh, that's, that's how it's been this year, although my excellent colleagues may well want to argue about that. A couple of issues there that would be good to pick up. Um, the first one being Russia. You've been twice this year already. Um, you've got I'm a visa, and you're going back. Yes. Well, you've got a visa that, that's valid yes. until what the end of end of uh, this year. How do you feel about visiting somewhere that has been so antagonistic to to the West, especially given Salisbury? Well, I'm not just antagonistic. Absolutely, <laughs> behaved disgracefully in every possible sphere. In Syria, what Russia has been doing is unspeakable. Um, of course, in Ukraine also, in Georgia, um, uh, circumstantial evidence suggests they were responsible for the downing of um, MH17. Um, this is an unspeakable regime. And how can you possibly go there and spend money which indirectly is going to benefit the, um, uh, the Russian state? Well, I suppose, um, and I know that you've... I'll, I'll come back to you and ask you a question in a minute. Um, serve you, right? Um, <laughs> the... the um, I'm going to go back to the first time I sort of went abroad on my own for a long trip, and that was um, just after Franco died. Um, he was the dictator in Spain, and uh, the reason I hadn't gone any earlier was because my parents said, you can do anything you want to, they were wonderful, you know, go anywhere you like, but you can't go to Spain, by the way, because that's a fascist dictatorship. And um, uh, quite, quite right too, I think. At the independent and maybe more widely among the travellers that we've got here, I think we take the view that person-to-person -person contact is good, and certainly in Russia, um, the Russian state has spent ages telling everybody how, how the West was awful, and the West showed up 
And the Russians said, well, you're great. You're just normal people, and let's have a great time. The West had spent quite a long time, and the Foreign Office, I, I tracked everything they were saying, was basically saying, well, you could go to Russia, but if you do, you know, if you happen to be, to be black or Asian, you're going to have a terrible time. If you happen to be gay, you're going to have a terrible time, um, and probably, actually, you're going to have a terrible time, so probably don't bother. And there were more Peruvians in Russia than there were England supporters. Um, but uh, we discovered that, actually, and there I was with the Nigerian supporters in Kaliningrad and various other random people turning up. Everybody had a fantastic time. So I think that people-to-people -people contact kind of justifies going to these places. The only place that the independents ever had an absolute veto of was um, Burma, and that was because they were effectively using slave labour to build the, the tourism infrastructure. But this is when I come back to you and say, oh, no. if I'm not mistaken, I read a very good <laughs> independent minds story which said, don't worry about the Rohingya, come to Burma, it's great, or Myanmar. Yes, very much along those lines. Um, I, so I travelled to Myanmar, not Burma any longer, Myanmar last October, um, and was very in two minds about it, actually, whether or not to boycott it, or whether or not to go and spend my money. And in the end, the decision that we came to was that it was better to visit somewhere and pay my, you know, our money to people on the ground, employ local guides, you know, go to local restaurants, drink at local bars, and try and make sure that our money went to the very people that needed it the most. And I think as well, why we shouldn't ignore these countries. I mean, Myanmar is spectacular. I had a great time and I feel sometimes a little bit icky about even admitting that, but it really was spectacular. And I think ignoring these countries, you take them off the map entirely. And then that just encourages these regimes to thrive. And by keeping the spotlight on them, by talking about them, by encouraging other people to visit, we can go in and try and bring some kind of international reason to them. I know that's not everybody's opinion and other people have had very you know, divided opinions about it, but I would visit Myanmar and I would encourage other people to do so. Can, can we on. just ask who's <laughs> been to Myanmar? Right, okay. Who would like to go to Myanmar and wouldn't mind about the terrible human rights abuses? Oh. Oh. <laughs> right. Okay, and who would not go at the moment because it's a, a horrible regime? Right. Okay. Um, Helen, where, where are you not going to? <laughs> ah, <laughs> um, I, you, know, do you know what? I've never been really in that position because uh, a lot of my travel is, is short haul and it just has never been that contentious an issue for me. I'm, I'm really in two minds about it. I haven't come to a conclusion yet, but I do agree in terms of there's something about going somewhere and being a witness in some way that perhaps is important because actually if you just kind of turn your back or sort of put your head in the sand about it, I don't know. I don't know how helpful that is to literally just cut off a country because the people there, the citizens, it's not necessarily their fault. They didn't want this to be happening to them. And the idea that then they are just pariahs in the world and they don't get to meet outside influence and they don't get another point of view, I don't think that's a good thing. Um, I, I would simply say there's lots and lots of mainstream uh, destinations which are, are extremely questionable. So um, you would have seen in Tanzania, perhaps um, the mayor of Dar es Salaam said he was going to round up gay people. Um, the uh, law in the UAE, so Dubai visited by a million and a half Brits every year, says that homosexuality is illegal. China and Turkey have awful regimes doing terrible things so um yeah it's a tricky one um and maybe once we get onto your your views we will we will look at that but um tell you what we haven't mentioned brexit for a good five <laughs> minutes should we talk about that oh sorry have you got uh, other well i was just gonna, actually because i have a question that sort of reminded me of something you were talking about um and it's almost the opposite problem of myanmar so we're talking about over tourism and that's become a really kind of hot topic over the last two years i'd say places like barcelona like palma and mallorca like lisbon venice suddenly local residents being really kind of you know what it's got a bit much now can you just back off um and one of the things that often people say as advice how to go there and not really piss off all the locals is to not book airbnb and we've got a question from chris evans that says do you think 
Airbnb has had a positive or negative impact for city destinations. Um, and I find this really a tough one because I have read a lot of stuff from locals saying, stop using Airbnb, it prices out all the locals, they can't afford to live in their city. But I love Airbnb because <laughs> it means for the first time I can actually afford to go on city breaks that, you know, not that they don't pay me anything at the independent, but I really struggle <laughs> <laughs> to live in London and to save money and to be able to go on holiday. So suddenly it was this whole world of like, oh my gosh, 50 quid a night in this amazing flat that's right in the centre of the city. Ah! Uh, so I don't know, what, what do you guys think about that? Um, I, th I think if that, if you take a city like Amsterdam, like Barcelona, like New York, where there is actually a profound shortage of uh, cheap two-star accommodation, then it's great if you've got places for 50 quid a night. Um, and it's entirely in the gift of the local authority. If they want to crack down on Airbnb and either ban it or say you cannot industrialise it, and I think that's where the real problem lies, so that in um, Barcelona, for example, you have... People who used to own hotels just thinking, why am I paying to have a night porter and all that malarkey? Um, I'll just buy an apartment block, let it all out on Airbnb, and that obviously does terrible things to the human geography. Um, but again, over tourism in places, this is going straying away from Airbnb, but like Dubrovnik, like Venice, they, you know, 10, 5,000 people show up on a cruise ship. Well, that's entirely up to the... Uh, uh, the destination to decide if they want those people turning up. Um, if they want to tax them, they can do that, and that might benefit the community. So, I th and, and I think it's also, and this might be a bit controversial, and um, you may heckle, uh, but I think it, it's one of these issues that cures itself, because people go to Venice on a Saturday in August, find it absolutely intolerable, and don't go back, or maybe go back on um, a... Uh, a Wednesday night in November, when actually they could be at an independent minds event, um, and discover that it's a, a wonderful place at that time of year. Or they go to Piran in, um, across the Adriatic in, in Slovenia. So I think people will work out their own solutions. Mm. I, I agree. I mean, I think the one place I really noticed over tourism, definitely in the past couple of years, was in Kyoto, which I know is now what is it, they've introduced a tax or I think a limit on the number of tourists that are going to visit. Um, and I just, I didn't enjoy it at all. You know, it's got great reviews and lots of my, my friends in Asia, they were like, you must go to Kyoto, such great imperial capital, really lovely um, you know, nature, really great sort of restaurant scene. Just couldn't have a good time because it was swarmed by tourists and I escaped to Osaka as soon as possible. So I think you're right, if it's self-correcting, Happy to stick with that. Okay, any, <laughs> any Kyoto fans here who, who think that uh, that great city has been maligned? Oh, okay, well, we'd better move on to <laughs> Brexit then. <laughs> Back on our shores again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, so, look, I'm sorry to put you through this, everybody, but I just think, since we spend a lot of time on the travel desk worrying about this and thinking about it and trying to comprehend what's happening, what it means for tourism, we're going to do to very, very quick um, what you, we know what we don't know and what we think we know, okay? Um, and um, uh, this is a story I did which um, uh, seemed to have the subtitle Brexit is turning into a disaster movie for travellers and holiday makers. We shall see. You might agree, you might not. This is the day before the EU referendum. Michael O'Leary again, he's making a lot of appearances, um, campaigning for a uh, Remain vote. That went really well. Um, <laughs> As you know, um, you, many of you will have been into the booth and um, uh, put a cross in one of those boxes and we won't be asking which you chose. What we will be doing is looking at some of the headlines. This is the Daily Express, which I think was um, uh, quite keen on uh, Brexit and um, uh, millions face holiday chaos and apparently it's the fault of Brussels. Well, um, I, uh, and talking to one or two of you, I know that you've got trips coming up um, in Easter, uh, Easter holidays and people don't know what will happen, so I'm going to try and help you. Um, your passport will continue to be valid as long as it's not uh, valid for more than um, uh, 10 years, which some passports will be, and as long as it's not valid for less than three months, okay? Um, the uh, one effect of Brexit, which has already happened, is that in the olden days, 
um, you could get up to nine months credit on a passport. If you had time, time on your old passport, and look at this for perfect timing, that's somebody sensible who comes from Crawley. Um, uh, nine months exactly of, um, sorry, eight months of, of, of um, uh, free validity. That has now stopped because somebody in the uh, Home Office realised it was going to uh, mean that some people wouldn't be let in and that would be a bad thing for, for the image of Brexit, which of course um, has such a great image at the moment. <laughs> so there are, as soon as people realise that, going to be huge queues. Everybody is now being incentivised to renew their passport as late as possible because it's going to effectively cost you money. Then there will be huge queues, people suddenly trying to get to the passport office. Um, coming down the track, and we know this for certain, but we don't um, know exactly when it's going to be happening, is uh, something called ETIAS, the European Travel Information and Authorization System. It's going to be like getting a visa for Turkey or for India or wherever, or particularly for the US. Um, and you're going to have to um, uh, quite possibly have uh, details like fingerprints taken. And I categorise pretty much everything that's happening with Brexit as giving back control, which I think was the slogan, wasn't it? Um, because we, at the moment, if you've got a British passport, you turn up at any frontier in Europe, all they can do is check that it's you and your passport and that the, the two match. They cannot ask you anything, they can't uh, stop you coming in or anything, but once we leave, um, we will be giving back control and then you can be asked, for example, how are you going to support yourself while you're in uh, Spain, etc., etc. It's going to get quite tough. Um, and as I say, giving back control. One thing we do know now, or we think we know, um, this uh, has been the warning on the Ryanair website um, aimed at investors, not at travellers, because obviously they want to sell lots of, lots of tickets. Um, but this is what they have been saying. There is a distinct possibility, no flights from the end of March. We think from two weeks ago, that's not going to happen because the European Commission said, uh, when they published their what do we do if there's no deal, said you will still be able to fly between the two. There is actually an odd question, which is will you be able, for example, if you live in Paris, to buy a British Airways ticket to London and then on to the US? And that's certainly worrying the airlines. Um, trains, we actually genuinely don't know. Eurotunnel will continue, Eurostar we don't know, so you might see this um, image before long um, out of service. Um, I'm afraid we don't know that. And mobile roaming. Um, we, of course, will lose all the benefits that um, Europe has brought us in terms of uh, mobile roaming, online roaming, uh, where there is no extra cost. It all depends on your mobile provider. They may decide to do the decent thing, they may not. Um, and medical care? Well, uh, it's time for show and tell, everybody. So, I think you've probably all got an e-hit card. Yeah. Okay, and that's going to cease to be of any value whatsoever from the 30th of um, March onwards. Uh, the government has variously said, but this was David Davis when he was Brexit Secretary. First thing he said to the um, Brexit Select Committee was, oh, I don't think we're going to do that. The next thing he said to them six months later was, we're definitely going to do that, and it's all gone quiet since then. So we simply don't know. Um, you know just, you know, good luck, everybody, is, is all we can say, but that, that applies to quite a lot of um, uh, Brexit, I think. Um, oh, hang on. Ah, right, okay, forgive me, I'm, not, I'm, I'm getting a different thing here from there. Uh, anybody recognise this Frontier post? My excellent colleague did earlier. Uh, France and Spain, yeah, it's, at, um, it's on the uh, western end of the um, Pyrenees, the town of Ondai. Anyway, um, so uh, when you're driving, you, your UK licence, and we know this for a fact, will cease to be valid. You will need to have an international driving permit um, based on the 1949 Vienna Convention, if you're going to France, or the 1968 Vienna Contention if you're going to Spain. So if you're going across this border, you're going to have to have two of these, £7.50 from your post office if they get round to it. 
Um, but don't worry, because we're taking back control with our um, sort of black, sort of blue passports. Um, however, they're not going to be good old hardback British, proper British passports, because the International Civil Aviation Authority uh, organization in Miami, uh, sorry, in Montreal says so. And the disaster that awaits UK inbound tourism, um, just so you know, this is going to be our uh, slogan from now on, um, but it's going to be really terrible in a couple of ways, I'm sorry to say. First one is, um, one immediate effect of the collapse of um, sterling following the EU referendum is that the UK is a less attractive place for people to work, and so quite a lot of people are leaving the UK. And as a result of that, they are not inviting their friends and families to come to Britain and therefore have a, um, a lovely time and spend money as tourists. So that's going to disappear, um, but more significant than that. If you happen to be from one of the 25 EU countries which have identity cards, then those uh, will get you into any of the EU countries, plus a whole random selection of various Balkan countries, uh, plus Georgia, um, oddly enough. So it requires quite a lot of European people who don't have passports, because why would they bother, um, to go and get a passport so they can come to Britain. And what the inbound tourism industry is worried about is how many of those people will do that. So it's all going to be great, everybody. Um, shall we have a poll? Yes, I think okay. that's a good idea. <laughs> right. Would you like to formulate it? <laughs> Blimey, what, what? No, okay. No. <laughs> oh, we're going for, uh, obviously, this is legally binding and we'll do whatever the poll comes up with. Um, would you rather no deal, the deal we've got on the table at the moment, or a second referendum, a people's vote? Right. That's the so, we're going um, for. No deal. Ah. Right. Very okay, uh, we are a kind group of people, so whatever you vote is, is up to you. The current deal that has been negotiated and is, is regarded um, by the people who are doing the negotiation as the best that we could um, hope for. But we can't vote on that because we don't know what it is. <laughs> oh, no, no we, we do know what the agreement is. I've read it 585 <laughs> flipping pages. <laughs> yeah. Okay, all right, thank you. And a second referendum. Any, any, wow. right, okay. So there is a fourth choice. It's Can we have a fourth Parliament just yeah. says we'll stay in. Uh, right. Okay, <laughs> that, well. Give me <laughs> Sorry? EFTA. EFTA, okay. Um, <laughs> yes, we, 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 we're not, we, we had a fantastic, anybody come to the marvellous Brexit debate here? Because um, uh, we're not going to have that again yet, because you need, you need kind of professionals for that. Should we move? Oh, right. So any, any Brexit questions that you've been, you've been uh, given? Uh, well, I, yes, I've got one. Um, and it's kind of one we were planning to sort of talk about anyway. Uh, so Roger Giel has asked, we are due to travel to Malta in April. Should we worry about post-Brexit chaos? And I suppose a wider question is, you know, should you be booking a holiday post-March 29th or should you hold off? And if you are going to book, are there steps that you should take to actually try and safeguard your holiday? Uh, OK, well, as we know with the flights, or as we think we know, um, they will be continuing. Um, any package holiday is covered, ironically, by the package travel regulations, which are British legislation, and therefore they will stay, even though they were the Europeans' idea. So a very good way is to book a package holiday, because then if it does all go wrong, you'll be able to get all your money back because the holiday doesn't get delivered. Um, I would simply... Uh, be prepared for some disruption. We simply don't know what's going to happen in terms of passport checks when we get to uh, uh, countries. If you're driving, we have absolutely no idea what's happening between Dover and Calais, for example. And then you just need to check what the status of um, EHIC is if you are one of the people who uh, have got an insurance policy which says you must have an EHIC card. We haven't yet found out what's going to happen to those. Uh, or you self-insure on the reasonable grounds that there might be a condition you have, which means that you self-insure because you're only going to Europe and you'll get your health things covered. Um, so that's all I would do, but I would probably book. And the extraordinary thing is that bookings are roughly 12% up to Europe compared with this time last year. Uh, and... Uh, <laughs> uh, very, very good. Um, and the only thing I think is that people 
having no certainty at all with what's going on here. What's some certainty, which is they're going to get a holiday, <coughs> probably. So, awful. Any other Brexit? Um, I've got no other Brexit questions here. Um, okay. Although one thing I think probably everybody is well wants to know about pounds sterling is dropping. We know that much. No inbound tourists here. Do you not think the UK is it going to be more attractive, given that pounds are going to be a lot cheaper for Europeans? Well, well, We're suddenly going to have a big influx of tourists. Uh, well, if, if the pound continues to sink, there, there is a marginal effect, which is that we will look more attractive, but I think probably more attractive to people from outside Europe. Mm. Um, I think there will be, if, when we, we leave, there will be a, a sense of, of sadness, of, of um, maybe even resentment. And, right, well, good luck to them. They, they can disappear off into the Atlantic and... Um, uh, uh, so I think that might be a very significant um, effect, and there will be from the US, from Canada, from other parts, yeah, maybe Latin America, um, China, India, Britain will look proportionately cheaper, and you might get a marginal effect there, but mm. not, nothing, uh, nothing to uh, be joyful about, I'm afraid. Well, Sorry. there are other things to be joyful about. <laughs> other things to be joyful yes, about. Oh, next that sounds year. like it's a cue to find out what's happening next year. Um, lots to be joyful about. Let's have a look, um, uh, shall we? So all these great places uh, to go to. Um, there are, uh, well, everybody, I think, gets something to take home. Um, so there are no actual prizes for guessing where this is. But anybody want to yeah, shout, shout out? Greenland, but, but what is the airport? And if you can spell it, then I will personally buy you a drink. <laughs> Kanga Lusrak, yep, okay. Uh, but we won't go into the spelling, we'd be here too long. Um, uh, so lots of places to go. Uh, anybody recognize this? No, it's an airport, obviously. Uh, here's a clue Newquay, yeah, of course. So, having introduced non stop flights from Heathrow to Perth, Western Australia, the great thing which is happening at exactly the same time next year is going to be you'll be able to fly to Newquay, which is um, quite sad, really, because uh, it's a shame that you should have to fly to Newquay, but there we are. Um, other new destinations are available. Nobody's going to get this one. Oh, I was surprised. Uh, Charleston, South Carolina. British Airways flying there from, from Heathrow, which would be nice. Um, uh, saves transferring at, at Atlanta. Uh, and I don't suppose anybody gets this. I'm much more excited about this flight than anywhere else. Um, it could be anywhere, uh, Rotterdam or anywhere, Liverpool or Rome. To, uh, <laughs> uh, oh, thank you. I'm, I'm glad. Uh, yeah, uh, it's not Rotterdam. Um, it's uh, Baja California, Los Cabos, and TUI is flying in there from Gatwick from the 4th of November, and it's great. It's one of those wonderful 787 destinations where you can actually get there, and it's going to take sort of 14 hours, but um, it's worth it when you get there compared with all the other ways of getting there. And the one I'm really waiting for is non-stop to Honolulu, which is perfectly technically possible, but nobody is doing it. And that's what awaits you in Carbo, uh, broken English spoken here. Um, uh, something else to look forward to, which I flew out to uh, Istanbul to report upon, the close down of Istanbul's old airport and the um, uh, opening of the new one. It turned out I was three months too early. Um, <laughs> this is an artist's impression of what it will look like when it opens, we hope, on the 1st of um, January, although Turkish Airlines is still showing you all arrive at the old airport. Who knows? It will be an improvement, though. And, of course, the great thing is about whatever you say about the um, uh, Turkish regime, um, you can also say about the Qatari or the UAE regime, and as a place to change planes, it's much better because, frankly, Istanbul is one of the world's great cities, and so therefore you can have a stop over there, and you can even, and if you take nothing else away from this evening, and I wouldn't blame you if you didn't, um, just remember that if you stop in Istanbul for 24 hours, that nice Philip Hammond will pay for your stay because your um, liability for air passenger duty diminishes from £78 to £13. And so, therefore, just book yourself a trip. Uh, you're saving 65 quid. You can get a perfectly decent hotel and some very good food for that. Um, 
The Wild Atlantic Way, great marketing idea by the Irish who realised that if you string a few tracks and lanes and roads together down the west coast of Ireland and call it something exciting, people will go there. I am taken in. Um, Scotland copied it with the uh, North Coast 500. And then uh, next year, Iceland is doing the same with the Arctic Coast Way. It's uh, an exiting project is coming, but there we are. Um, <laughs> Their English is still better than my Icelandic. Um, and uh, lots and lots to appeal to you when you are out there. It's a beautiful part of the world with lots of fantastic things. Um, anybody recognize this? Mm. Mm. It, it was the, uh, the place I fell in love with Spain. When finally my, my parents let me go there because uh, Franco had um, passed away. It's Granada, the most beautiful um, uh, city in Spain, I thought, as I sat and looked at that. And it's still very beautiful, um, absolutely gorgeous. And something happened yesterday, which is really exciting, which is that the train link from Madrid was restored. There's a slow train which takes five hours, but they've got a special tourist rate. They're quite embarrassed because it's taken them so long to fix the railway. 20 euros from Madrid to uh, Malaga, uh, sorry, to um, uh, Granada. Uh, and then in June, the high-speed thing arrives, and it's only three hours. So it's really good to combine two cities together. Um, oh, nobody's going to get this one. They, they're really not. No, although I can see why you're saying that. That sounds so arrogant, doesn't it? <laughs> um, sorry. Uh, no, it's, it's Plovdiv, the second city of Bulgaria. And next year, it's the... It's the capital of culture, along with... Matera, yeah, very good. Here we are. Here, here's Matera. Um, so um, uh, great cities to go to, both of them. And it, but, but even better, I would say, is to go to a capital of culture the year after because you've got all the great stuff there, uh, but you haven't got all the tourists. So bear that in mind as well. Um, now we're on to the places it's easier to get to bit which is, I think, quite important. Belarus, two years ago, is the toughest place in the world to get into, oh, sorry, in Europe to, to get into. Um, they then said, right, we're going to allow you, if you fly into Minsk airport, you can stay for five days. Um, they're now saying, fly into Minsk airport and you can stay for a month, uh, which is very good. Talking to one of our excellent guests earlier, saying, how should I spend five days in um, Lithuania? Well, start off by flying into Minsk. Um, because it's only two hours on the bus from there and you'll be able to say, uh, because you can fly in and then walk out, you'll be able to uh, combine that with, um, while we're there, Vilnius and Klaipeda and uh, the Karunian split, um, which, of which more later. Uh, this, of course, is the Silk Road, which is now officially a good place to go, thanks to Joanna Lumley. Um, uh, it's more than just a good place to go. That's the market in Tashkent, by the way, because they have... First of all, introduced e-visas. It used to be, I went there last year, I had to go to the embassy in London twice, I had to give them £100. Um, it was all lots of uh, toing and froing and filling in pages and pages of forms. They've now got an e-visa which takes 10 minutes to do and £15, minutes, 15 pounds to buy. Even better, if you fly in on Uzbekistan Airways and fly out again within six days, then you are, don't need any visa at all. Neither do you if you're under 16, oddly. Um, there we are. Um, so definitely there. And it, back to the Coronian spit. spit. So um, if you are travelling from Lithuania down this extraordinary uh, uh, sandy spit, which goes for about 100 miles down the coast of the Baltic, you eventually stop because you get to the Russian border. Um, but the word on the Ulitsa is that from Next year, they're going to introduce e-visas as well, which means that you'll be able to have this wonderful Baltic trip, which begins in Estonia and Tallinn and goes down through Riga, through Vilnius and Klaipeda, down a Koronia, into beautiful Kaliningrad, um, just so you know where we are, and then finishing up in Gdansk. And that's going to be good fun because Kaliningrad, of course, is a bit of Russia that they, they um, well, the Yalta... Uh, uh, conference has quite a lot to answer for, um, but this used to be Königsberg, it's now um, uh, Kaliningrad. And one final one, um, uh, I thought I got everything ready by this afternoon, and then this came in, and it, nobody recognises this at all. Um, it's the Falklands, it's Port Stanley, 
and um, news literally just in this afternoon uh, from a yet to be decided time in 2019 there will be a non-stop flight once a week from Sao Paulo to the Falklands which is suddenly going to make it less than 24 hours journey and you won't need to go from Bryce Norton on an RAF freighter and it will be a lot cheaper and uh, so I think that's going to be a, a, a good place to go as well. Whew. So that was, um, that, that was, that's next a year. Run yes. Uh, any matters arising? So we've got an interesting question here um, from Trevor Cox and I think it ties in very well obviously with 2019 what you're looking forward to and he asks if you could revisit any one city or place wh which would it be? Ooh. Um, well, uh, actually, I'm going to... Um, uh, that's a very good question. I'm going to say, and this is because I didn't spend enough time there, um, uh, back to Uzbekistan, I'm afraid. Uh, the place that I most enjoyed last year was not Tashkent, although I love great Soviet-style cities. They're just very funny. Um, not Samarkand, although that was spectacular, with the huge benefit of a uh, Soviet-style city attached to it, which is very funny. Um, not Bukhara, which is just heavenly and beautiful, but Khiva, K-H-I-V-A, um, which is right down at the Turkmenistan border. Um, and uh, that is this miraculous kind of medieval uh, place with the most astonishing uh, Islamic architecture, which has been preserved through 75 years of, of state communism and life there is uh, just astonishing. They've also got lots of nice little hotels and you can sit on the roof and drink your beer and um, uh, think how lucky you are to be enjoying that. Anybody been to Khiva? Oh, okay. Very good. Well, I hope everybody else will. But that was a long story. And it's not even that, you know, it's certainly not a city break if that's what uh, Trevor, was it Trevor who asked? Trevor, yeah. Trevor, if, if, if it's not a city break as such, but that's a city I would want to go back to. I have to ask you too. <laughs> I mean, there are so many places I would love to go back to this year, um, next year now, actually. Um, I went to Bangalore earlier this year and had an absolutely amazing time, and I would definitely visit again next year. What, it's, what's the hotel Bangalore? I mean... Yeah, I know. Uh, oh, well, Bangalore. Mumbai is lovely. Uh, Mumbai is lovely, but... What really sold me about Bangalore was how compact it was. Like Bom Bombay, you can be going for hours and hours and hours, stuck in traffic, in a taxi, and never get anywhere. Whereas Bangalore, because it's so compact, I was walking around the, the main centres, and I felt like I could see everything. It's also incredibly green. I mean, you're not by the waters. You are obviously in Bombay, but yeah, I thought That's it was wonderful. Great point, nightlife as well. <laughs> uh, no, no more colonial names, please. Sorry, yeah. Bangalore. <laughs> Um, where else? I mean, I just moved back from Hong Kong and I would love to go back to Hong Kong next year to go and see how it's changed. It's definitely evolving at a very swift pace, um, mostly sort of the political uh, situation over there, but I would love to go back there. Um, Arizona is on my list for next year. <laughs> it's not actually a city as far as I know. Sorry, no, 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 it's not. But Phoenix, I'd love to go to Phoenix. And actually American Airlines have got a new route from next year. Um, yeah, so that's probably mine. Helen? Oh, I just, I hate this question. It's like when someone <laughs> says, what's your favourite book? And you suddenly can't remember any book you've ever read. And you're like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> Spot the dog. Um, I, I went to Norway for the first time this year, ski touring. And it's a bit basic to say Norway, but it, it just, I mean, it's ridiculous. It's so beautiful. I couldn't even get over it. I was just fjords, <laughs> slopes, no people. I just saw a tiny house and thought, I'd like to live there. And never speak to anyone ever again. I hate to, hate to raise it, but rather like Arizona, it's not technically a city, Norway. It said place on oh, that did it? question. No, it said city. No, city or place. Oh, city or place. I, okay, I sorry. Listening <laughs> right, okay. Right, good. Oh, what's your favourite book, by the way? <laughs> don't, don't, no. Um, I do have a slightly related question, actually, which is more about city. Um, it says... Uh, sorry, Kevin Waldock says, we tend to go away on short breaks, three to four days, rather than long holidays. We've done most of the usual short haul suspects. What off-radar locations are worth considering? We are more interested in local cultures rather than sun and sea. Oh, well, I would say anywhere... Anywhere you could mention 
Well, no, any, anywhere on the right-hand side of the um, Iron Curtain, if anybody can remember the Iron Curtain. Uh, I, I think there is just so much to be, to be discovered, and I would probably actually say the southeastern Balkans, in particular, um, that the most entertaining short break you can have um, is, at the moment is uh, almost certainly flying to Chisinau in, um, uh, in Moldova. Uh, you can actually, as I did um, earlier this year, combine it with the astonishing monasteries of northeastern Romania. Um, but you get to Chisinau, and it's a ludicrous... I mean, it was a, it's a completely made-up country, even more than Belgium is Moldova. <laughs> um, but it's still got the um, Hotel Chisinau, £25 a night. Um, it, it's the former hotel in tourist, and you have your breakfast in a cave. And it's always interesting when you go to these places to see what their idea of, of looking after guests is. But then you go to... Uh, and there's, there's various interesting sort of things to see. But then you get on a bus and you go to Transnistria, which is a breakaway republic. Um, and, of course, it's a terrible thing that the Russians have not only annexed Crimea, got a bit of Georgia, done terrible things to the rest of the world, but they've also sent in a few battalions to annex half of um, Moldova. But it's very funny. You go in over the border, suddenly you are in real, uh, real Russian city, no, connection, no connections with anywhere. Um, you can go to the post office, but you can't post a postcard to anybody. I don't know if it'll be post a postcard these days, but if you did want to, it could only be to any address in, in Transnistria where you may not yet have any friends. And that was really funny. But, but um, again, I bow to your, uh, your better judgment for, for off-the-radar places. I think Helen is the one to kick this one off. You're Am definitely I? a fan <laughs> of Eastern European um, <laughs> cities. <laughs> That's true. I've always, I mean, I haven't been to loads of them, but I'm always commissioning city guides for obscure second cities in the Eastern Europe because I think it's just so exciting, all these places finally starting to open up to tourism. Um, I don't know if this, it probably doesn't constitute off-radar, but I'm just mad about Rotterdam because I went there recently. Um, and before I went, everyone told me it was going to be really ugly and like just, you know, it's no Amsterdam, you know, it's no oil painting. <laughs> and I was like, all right, guys. And then I went and I just thought it was beautiful. I mean, it's not sort of quaint, but it's got the most amazing architecture ever because they've just had to rebuild everything since World War II and they were like right let's get on with it let's do something exciting so every street you go down there's just some mammoth crazy building that here everyone would be like oh I'm not sure it's a, crawly a bit, bit much like that. <laughs> it's just like Crawley I was gonna say all the time I was there I was thinking what does this remind me of Crawley yeah uh, so if you haven't been I would definitely say get on a Eurostar you can go direct now it's amazing for a couple of days before yes. the end of March. Mm. Yeah, so. the end of March. <laughs> yes. um, I recently went to Leipzig in mm. sort of former East Germany, which actually I thought was fantastic. Very similar to what um, Helen, she was just saying. I think because it's got such an open vibe, it used to host this kind of really expansive world fair and welcome lots of different people from all around the world. It's just got this really welcoming, awesome feel to it. But the most important thing, I went for lunch on the 29th floor, a restaurant called Restaurant Panorama. Um, I think it was on a Friday, and a three-course lunch, guess how much it cost me, including coffee? Any idea? Any idea? 12 euros. 12 euros for three courses and a cup of coffee on the 29th floor with the best view in the entire, you know, city. You're definitely... I should have gone to all. <laughs> um, I just thought it was a fantastic city, really fantastic city and completely welcoming. The nightlife is also amazing, not that I did any of it. I went to bed at, I think, 11 o'clock. But, um, yeah, that would be my, definitely my recommendation. And um, I think uh, Leipzig also has the biggest railway station in Europe, it oddly. It does. Oh, it that's does. lucky. Yeah. 24 platforms. 24 platforms. I think there might only be 23 because one of them... I think I was asking about this. One of them got sliced off at the end, made into a cafe or something. Um, right. Well, if, if nobody's <laughs> losing the will to live, we can find out which platform Sorry. the Weimar train's on. Um, uh, OK, shall we move on? Oh, have you got any other questions? No? OK. No. Uh, oh. Good, good, good. We're, we're, oh, this is the last bit of sort of slides and all talking and all that nonsense, and then we'll, we'll, we'll get your, your views and things will, will improve steadily. But I just wanted to talk, because... 
lots and lots of people get in touch about risk and I'm sort of living proof that there isn't really any risk in travel. It's never been safer. Now, of course, we spend half our lives at the Independent. Well, these two do. Obviously, I'm um, <coughs> working. Um, uh, doing, covering stories such as the fact that if you are handling a tray at an airport, the number of bugs on that trail, tray is through the roof. And of course, airports tend to be where people um, congregate from all over the world with all kinds of exotic diseases. So you need to wash your hands. But risks are very, very simple. I am extremely risk averse, but I just worry about three things, really. First of all, these uh, mosquitoes, they do horrible things. They spread Zika virus, um, which, is, which is a bad thing. They uh, spread yellow fever, of course, um, malaria, which is such a terrible, terrible burden on many parts of the tropical world. Um, I don't, in the field of medicine, worry about things like Ebola, um, which, of course, it was a terrible thing that happened to Sierra Leone, to Liberia, to Guinea. Um, there are cases now in Congo. Uh, it, it's an awful, awful disease, but we are in the extraordinary position of not having to worry about it as uh, tourists as, as travellers. Um, you might have seen this story uh, online, 2014. Um, this was the case of uh, uh, somebody who had very sadly contracted Ebola and was being medevaced um, and, and so on. And you've got this guy with his clipboard who doesn't wear any protection. And that's because he's the only sensible person in that, in that picture. He probably woke up this morning and thought, am I going to exchange bodily fluids with somebody who has sadly contracted Ebola? I don't think I'm going to. So I don't really need to get all dressed up. But the whole idea took root that he was being mad, but he just you know, read the information which is freely available on the World Health Organization uh, website about how you would contract Ebola. And he thought, well, that's not for me. Um, and here we have another one, another headline, Surf Resort Closed Down by Brain-Eating Amoeba. Um, terrible things happen, but actually we're very lucky to be protected against them. Um, this is uh, Sharm El Sheikh, obviously still off the radar and as a tourist destination because the British government does not believe that airport security at Sharm El Sheikh is good enough yet. Um, even though the accounts from people who go through it is that it's far better than almost anywhere else in Africa and lots of places in Europe too. Um, that, of course, is still having a bad effect on tourism to Egypt. Um, Turkey has had a better year, but there are still concerns about it. And in no sense do I wish to diminish the absolute horror of terrorist attacks that we have seen, but personally, I put it in the same realm as air crashes. Yes, they happen. Yes, they're awful. But they are so infinitesimally rare that simply they are not worth considering as a risk. And so um, I really do not, you know, I, would, I do not go against Foreign Office advice, um, except I think in the case of Sharm El Sheikh Airport. But uh, it's, it's one of those risks which I think people have the wrong perception of when they should be worrying about other much more likely things. For example, we had the British Airways data breach. Um, we've had um, bizarre things like um, hackers breaking into Bristol Airport and um, destroying the, um, uh, uh, the, 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 the departure screens there. And I think some kind of cyber crime related to terrorism is, I fear, going to be uh, happening. Um, but Terrorism is not something you need to worry about. You need to worry about drinking. Not when you're going to get the next one, because that's going to be quite soon, I hope, but what other people are drinking. And I genuinely fret about alcohol causing some uh, very serious alcohol-related issue. This, ladies and gentlemen, is something I spotted at Bristol Airport, where you can upgrade your breakfast. How do you upgrade it? You spend an extra £1.50, you get a pint of Foster's or a glass of wine, which is just what you need at 7 o'clock in the morning. And genuinely, 
alcohol and travel do not mix. The British have a terrible um, uh, reputation for uh, drinking, and that being a lot of uh, uh, the reason we travel. This um, is actually in Quito in Ecuador, um, bizarrely. So uh, don't drink and, for example, think it's going to be a great idea to stagger across a road because road accidents are by far the biggest um, cause of, of death for British tourists abroad. Um, and hiring a motorbike because you've um, had a great lunch uh, with several uh, glasses of Retsina in Greece is always a bad idea. The other thing, sadly, which um, second only to road accidents is uh, accidents in water, um, and you really need to know how zip, uh, how rip uh, currents work and know how to uh, survive them. Um, but we do lots of really silly things as tourists. Um, if you look at the average plane, which goes from Gatwick to Geneva, outbound, 200 people sitting on it, all perfectly healthy, coming back, um, including some of their children, um, there will be three or four people in plaster. If we take that risk, and yet we fret about terrorism. And I'm, I'm perfectly happy to, to go skiing and take those risks, but I'm aware that they are more significant than most of the things that we do. Uh, this was at a, a travel cafe I went to. Um, it's pretty much accurate, and that's what I would, um, I would go, go by. One thing I do need to worry, warn you about, um, where's this going? I know some of you get it. Naples. Naples, yes, and what's that in the background? Smouldering away. Vesuvius. Yes, it is. Now, um, interestingly, it's got an um, uh, eruption cycle of about 45 years, and it's about 10 or 15 years over, uh, overdue. Now, of course, we all know how to pronounce Eia Fiatio Jökult, because that was the um, uh, Icelandic um, uh, volcano in 2010. There's a pronunciation guide if you need one. Um, uh, Oh, you, you can possibly, if you're travelling, uh, you can remember where you were. Um, I was um, uh, pretending to work in Norway. Um, you didn't need to speak great Norwegian to realise things weren't going particularly well. Um, I went out as um, a passenger on SAS, and I came back as freight on a container ship. There we are. Um, but genuinely, the world is very survivable. It's a better time than there has ever been for being a traveller. We are hugely enriched by travel and hopefully we can enrich the world, both materially and possibly even spiritually. But that's quite deep, isn't it? Um, we, better, we better move on to some proper questions. There we are. Yes, I feel we've been speaking enough. <laughs> Let's open the, the floor to you guys. Who's got any questions that wants to kick us off? Uh, while Peter is thinking of a question, <laughs> I do have one that's related to risk that I could read out first. So, you know, start composing in your mind. Uh, this one's from Brian Mitchell, and I think it, it's quite good having talked about risk. Um, I've noticed several issues you have commented on regarding poor quality customer service when booking air travel through online and usually offshore companies. I assume people using apps on phones, etc., get directed to these companies. Do they pay for this to be done uh, rather than do the obvious and book direct with the airline? So should people be warned off using apps for booking air travel? Oh, uh, good, good question. So um, there, one reason it's never been a better time to travel is because we've never had so much choice. And crucially, we can all pretend we're travel agents. I, I, I have a lot of time and um, spend a lot of money with uh, real travel agents because they're generally better than I can do. But in the, in the case of a straightforward flight, you can go online and, of course, go to a very good site like Skyscanner and um, see all the options and all the fares. That's terrific. But the way they make their money, and they're providing extremely valuable service, so they've got to make some money, um, is by you think, oh, I'll have that uh, flight to Moscow for 170 quid, and you click through to an agent. And this agent you might not never might never have heard of, but it's something.co.uk, so you think that's marvellous. And you book through them, and uh, yes, it's a genuine ticket, um, but things, there's all kinds of things that can go wrong. 
um, starting with, uh, if you make any mistakes on spelling your name, the immediate reaction of the uh, uh, agency is, you've lost all your money, buy another ticket through us. Uh, the airline might say, well, of course, we'll correct spelling mistakes, or if you've got your last and your first name muddled up, we'll swap those around for free. But we can't do that because your contract's with your travel agent and you've got to do it through them and they're refusing. So that's, that's a, a problem. If there are changes to your booking, you might not hear about them. You might have been sold a ticket which you inferred included baggage, but you didn't. So there's all sorts of reasons for not booking them. So why would anybody ever do it? Well, because often they are cheap. They will have airline combinations that the airlines will never sell themselves. So for example, I was in Toronto and I needed a cheap flight back to London and I got this very cheap deal, BA, sorry, Air Canada to Amsterdam and BA from there to Gatwick. Now, that's not a combination that any airline's going to sell because it's not, uh, you've got Star Alliance with Air Canada and One World with, with BA. And it worked. I tend to buy them only when it's a very short time between when I buy it and when I'm traveling because there's less scope for anything to go wrong. Um, but genuinely, they will often have um, uh, better deals. But it's also worth just checking where they're based. And generally, if you scroll far enough down, then they'll say, oh, yes, call our customer service line between 9 and 5 Greek time or Ukrainian time. And that's a clue. Um, but I don't know, have you had the experience of um, online travel agents you book through them? I'm, I'm very old fashioned actually. I just, I don't. I always book direct. I think I've probably written too many horror stories from people <laughs> saying just that. Like, oh, we, oh, there was one recently that was a great one that they said they just had noticed that their flight, you know, wasn't going overhead. Oh, yes. And so they rang up and they were like, oh, no, that, that flight doesn't exist anymore. It's gone. Yes. <laughs> they're like, oh, I see. Yeah. Were you ever going to tell us that? Um, so I think actually just working in this industry has just taught me it's always better to book direct if you can, unless, as you say, there's, you know, a really great deal or the only way you can do it is via an agent. Sometimes that really cheap price is just too good to say no to, though. Yeah. I mean, I would always, always rather book direct, and now I always encourage everybody I know to book direct. But when you're offered a direct flight for £800 or a £400 flight via Expedia or, blimey, who was it? Lastminute.com. I had many, many issues with trying to get a flight to India. It's just too good. I mean, it is too good to be true. And actually, I had to cancel my... my agency booked flight because they wouldn't honour the price they'd sold it to me for, but they wouldn't actually honour it with the airline. And the airline said, we're not paying £400. You know, she's got to pay £800. So I had to rebook it direct. So sometimes it is too good to be true, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so anybody thought of a question yet? Uh, ah, OK. Oh, suddenly. Right. Yeah. OK. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, this is a bit of an obscure one. I'm thinking next summer of taking a trip along the Pamir Highway um, between Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan. Best to go with an organised tour or get a jeep locally to drive me or any thoughts? Oh, um, right. I, I've been to Kyrgyzstan, which is just coming back, coming onto the adventure tourism uh, map, which is a very, very good time to be there. I've not been to Tajikistan. Uh, and well, all I can do is sort of give a slightly general answer, which is that probably you would be perfectly well off um, getting a flight out to Bishkek and uh, probably Turkish Airlines, in fact, um, and then seeing what you can sort out locally and you get a, a much better deal. But if you want to get confidence and if you particularly want to reduce risk, then going with a company like Explore or Exodus or, or somebody would be good because they come with lots and lots of um, health and safety issues sorted out. And it is a, a fairly wild and dangerous part of the world in terms of road safety. And so, therefore, it's good to know that you've got well-maintained vehicles and well-maintained drivers, I would say. Anybody been to um, Tajikistan? No? No? Oh, go on then. Well, you better get back, get together <laughs> afterwards, uh, uh, people behind you, and then we can uh, we can we, we we can sort that out. Um, next question, please. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, we. Um, Not right. Um, 
Right. Go on. <laughs> right, here we are. Um, oh, um, the, the gentleman here, sorry. Yeah, and then. <laughs> you kind of touched on it earlier with regarding Ryanair's baggage policy. Yes. And a lot of the airline's baggage policies are very confusing. And also, you can get a good deal if you take no baggage whatsoever on a lot of airlines now. Now, you can buy special clothing to put <laughs> <laughs> your necessary holiday clothing, etc., in. Can they actually stop you boarding the plane if you do that? What is the standing as far as wearing stuff? Well, you could do that. Um, I, would, I would say... Don't pack so much or um, go on a, a, an airline with a, a completely off the scale cabin baggage policy, which is British Airways, 46 kilograms in two bags, which is ridiculous. Um, but, well, I, I used to um, frisk people at Gatwick Airport. It was for a job, not a hobby. Um, <laughs> and um, I think there would be, a, in, the, in the olden days, of course, everybody had 20 kilograms of luggage, so it was never... A, uh, an issue, but I think if you arrived at the security check in a form that was um, particularly unusual, that might raise some eyebrows, and certainly when you got to the gate, it might do, but I don't think it's been ever legally tested, and I don't think that people have been thrown off planes for having... Sorry? Exactly. Well, well, if you didn't hear that, the, the lady here said, why do people need so much carry-on luggage, well, that's because they're doing what you and I do, which is trying to avoid paying extra for well, checking in bags. Pamela Neary said that she doesn't mind if people have a coat with 100 pockets. OK. Right, so you can take your coat with 100 pockets, and if you get questioned, just say that this gentleman said it would be OK. I've seen flights advertised, and actually there's a £110 difference between luggage and taking no luggage whatsoever, so... And isn't it Either you choice? buy your stuff when you get there or you wear a big jacket with lots of pockets. It's like one blogger who sewed all of his clothes into his jacket <coughs> got on board nobody gave him a second look. I think you just yeah. have, it's about risk management. Again, you have to be prepared for them to go, you're having a laugh, give us 50 quid, and then you go, all right, Gov. But prob yeah, probably half the time it would work. I might take those off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, I was just going to say, like, I seem to recall some, uh, some story recently in the paper, maybe six months back, of somebody being denied boarding for wearing all of his clothes. <laughs> so he had you know, four jumpers and two pairs of jeans and three right. jackets or whatever it was, and they denied him boarding. Okay. Maybe well, it was well, Ryanair. I forget exactly. I'm, yeah. I'm not entirely sure, but well, I know there has been a case in the not-too-distant yeah. past of somebody denied boarding. Maybe he was going a bit too far. Something like that, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so, well, we're, we're the jury's out on that. But, I mean, I must say, I think if... How, how can I put it? I think that if you are that exercised about how much stuff you're taking in hand luggage and how much you're trying to avoid paying, then you're probably not celebrating the uh, incredible good value that, that travel is these days. And, um, and you, you, yeah, just, just, I think... Just, just go with it. Um, apart from anything else, is in aviation, unfortunately, we are expected just to sit there quietly and get on with just being quiet and not any fuss. And I fear that that, that will continue for some time. So, yes, don't, don't, don't make a fuss. Wait till you get there, probably, I think. But um, people may, may feel differently. Um, um, any further questions? Yeah. Sorry, I think you had one. <laughs> well, we've got well, just just a follow-up oh, question. How are Appreciate you doing, it. actually? I mean, every airline has different... Uh, measures now, um, so you need probably like five suitcases f for all your oh, yes. travel, or do you have a cupboard full full of different sizes to accommodate all the requirements? Or <laughs> well, the, yeah, the, the, it is it is a bit bizarre, especially if you went for the Ryanair cabin baggage January 2018 edition, mm -hmm. and you went out and you bought your case and you thought, right, I'm going to be fine now. From now on, I've got the the 10 kilogram case, right volume and everything, and then suddenly you discovered it was no use at all because they've gone for a really small size, which nobody else does. If you're going on Flybe, because they've got little planes, they've got a different one. EasyJet are quite good, and no weight limit, but only one piece. Um, 
and that will often have it to go in the hold and then BA are just, um, you know, bring what you want, you know, um, uh, and, and so, so it is confusing, but I don't know that that's necessarily a bad idea. Everybody, you know, you can go back to the days when, yes, your ticket bought you 20 kilograms of luggage, but you were paying for that, whether or not you took advantage of it, it was adding costs in doing so. And <coughs> um, yeah, airlines are desperately trying to claw back whatever they can because the basic price of um, flights keeps diminishing. So you can't really blame them. All you can do is, um, is, is, uh, is, is fight back. And if that involves wearing a coat of many pockets, then, <laughs> then, then why not? Um, yeah. Thank you. Th this, this lady here with the red top, sorry. <laughs> Um, well, I do fill in one of those things, but it's obviously it's not going to be true. Um, so my husband asked, asked me to ask this question. Um, you may remember a couple of months ago that um, there was a discussion, not only a report, about um, different airports and their ability or lack of ability to cope with disabled passengers. Um, and we've certainly had experience of that, and we've had experience in other countries w where they've been absolutely wonderful, and Terminal 3 where they've, well, we won't go there. And um, so the question is really, what can be done to, to help the disabled passenger and their, their carer? Mm. Uh, well, mm. much more is the short answer yeah. to that. Um, and clearly, since we are lucky to be living in an age where um, we're all touching wood, living longer um, and able to travel because the cost is so low. Um, and therefore, the, it is natural that the proportion of people who are um, in the terrible jargon of aviation, our PRMs, um, persons of reduced mobility, is going to increase. And of course, they need to be welcomed and properly looked after. And I'm afraid it's just going to come from public pressure. It needs to come from, it should be coming from government, but it's not. But it's also really important to remember who's responsible for this, and it is the airline. So, therefore, um, you'll remember the great Frank Gardner, um, wheelchair user, BBC security correspondent, got to Heathrow and he, he was stuck on the plane for 70 minutes or something absurd. Everybody had got off. Um, he couldn't. Uh, and he was tweeting like this, from, from there, and Heathrow Airport did actually say, we're terribly sorry, we're going to meet you and we're going to sort out what's going on. But actually, it was ultimately the uh, airline or rather the ground agents they had contracted. So I think when there is a terrible incident like that, it needs to be called out. And I hope that airlines will, first of all, become increasingly good but also um, we'll realise that it's a, a very important um, uh, sales point as well to, to be uh, kind, I hope. Uh, what I said about Terminal 3 um, was that uh, you're sort of deposited in a place just behind Este Lodo. Ooh. And um, you sort of sit there and they say they'll call you when the flight is called. No, they don't and you can see it on the screen, you can go there. And then you go round a corner and you wait for um, a sort of buggy. And the buggy will only take you so far. And then there's somebody waiting with three wheelchairs which are attached and are motorised. And he said to me, well, I haven't got room for you. And I said, no, 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 I can walk. You know, so then we're deposited at the desk. We're not even deposited at the plane. Uh, that, well, so, that's that's all know, wrong. And it therefore is all wrong. Well, it's wrong, but, but also it is something that you can, in those particular circumstances, you can go to the Civil Aviation Authority and say, this airline on this day did this wrong, and they will jolly well go and well, talk them out. But it's the airline, because the, the, it was Virgin. And so the other side, Newark, um, absolutely no problem, met at the gate of the the plane and taken out all the way to the car park without any problem at all. Um, coming back, um, ah, there, there, there are wheelchairs, but you know, these motorized ones, um, well, you'll, um, you'll have to wait. And the crew stayed with us that's, that's until they came, which was absolutely simple. I cannot fault Virgin at all. Well, well you can with respect, I'm sorry, because <laughs> uh, while those crew were great, 
the airline contracts with a ground handler to look after people who need extra care. And if they have not got a good ground handler, then it's their responsibility. So phone up Richard Branson. You can be confronted with one of the things that I was. Uh, they knew I was disabled. They knew I couldn't play this. They just didn't they know quite more than I was. They didn't have the means of even to lift anything, but to obfuscate my pain. I had to work to climb the stairs. I had rarely seen long. Oh, it's, it's awful. That there are some new things called Abbey ramps, which are very good, which is very simply, um, you might have seen there's a couple of them at Gatwick, instead of the normal stairs, which you know, are challenging um, for, for people of reduced mobility, people with, with children, whatever, people with big coats. Um, <laughs> and so these things just, just uh, it's, it's a sort of a ramp that spirals up, and that seems to work quite well. So hopefully things will, will get better. I hope. I think they need to pay, pay attention to what they do with carers as well. Because my wife is my carer. Uh, they ignore that. Well, again, complain yeah. to the Civil Aviation yeah. Authority yeah. that they will sort it out. Um, now, how are we doing for time? We've we got time for a couple more questions. If there are a couple more questions, a couple uh, question here in front row. <coughs> Hi, um, I just want to go back to the discussion about risk and oh. the world being a safer place and um, I wanted to ask about hitchhiking which I know you're a great advocate of and um, you wrote a very nice piece last week about some of your experiences on the road. Oh, thank um, you, I haven't paid for this question. To be yeah. honest, <laughs> um, I wondered if you think that is a safe mode of transport for all travellers to enjoy. Oh, well, first of all, thank you for the, the kind question. Um, I'm not, I don't think I would ever say that anything is safe, um, although, and this is, this is slightly, slightly um, uh, peripheral, no, completely peripheral, um, if you want to reduce your chances of being harmed in an aviation accident, then the two safest airlines in the world by a mile are Ryanair and EasyJet. Um, but, so, so, so there is risk attached to everything. Um, the main risk of hitchhiking, in my experience, which has been really rather too long, um, is that you'll be involved in a road accident rather than anything else will happen. But on the other hand, I'm male, I'm six foot two, and therefore perhaps in a less vulnerable position. So I think it's something with, that, depending on the circumstances, you would, uh, you would hitchhike if you felt it, the balance of probabilities was going to be okay. Yeah, if you're in the far north of, of Scotland or somewhere else remote, apart from Nova Scotia. Anybody here from Nova Scotia? Um, it's absolutely the worst place in the world for hitchhiking. I have no idea why, because Canadians are nice. Um, every other province is fine. Um, but but the, in, in, in kind of rural areas, then, of course, you hitchhike, because that's the way everybody gets around. So I think you kind of just need to feel how comfortable you are. I just think it has brought wonderful rewards to my travel. I'd like to say that I've given lots of people lots of lifts, but I don't. I, I can drive, but I don't have a car, so that's quite, that's quite tricky. Um, I just think it is injecting serendipity into a world where so much certainty is, um, uh, prevails, unless, of course, you're travelling by train. Um, <laughs> and I think it, it, you know, travel is, is wonderful and very, very good these days. And, of course, one reason you don't see lots of people at the bottom of the M1 is because they're all on megabus. Uh, having booked it three months ahead and paid a pound, and that's great. But if you want to uh, you know, put emotional connection back into travel, then hitchhiking is quite a good thing to do. I don't know, when did you last hitchhike? I've never hitchhiked. You've never hitchhiked? Oh, well, just you know, find a nice little island and, and try it there, and then you'll, then you'll think, well, this is fun, isn't it? Except if you're outside Dortmund in the rain for three hours, in which case you'll think, this isn't fun, what am I doing here, what an idiot. Um, but uh, anyway, thank you. Uh, so I think it's, it's generally, genuinely benign in an age when we have been told to be mistrustful. I think it's a good way of um, reminding yourself that humanity is genuinely good, I find. Um, I think we've got time for two more questions. Oh, they're both, oh, okay. Uh, we'll try and rattle through them and see Thanks, if any other questions the, the, There is a philosophy that uh, good uh, holidays make good uh, memories and bad ones make great anecdotes, but are there any 
places you've been where you've genuinely thought, never again? Oh, uh, thank you. Um, and I will ask my um, excellent colleagues the same question. Um, but I have had some truly terrible holidays um, which I have been solely responsible for. Um, the, the most worst one, I think if you Google uh, my name and worst holiday, you will come up with Adventure Canada. Oh, gosh, it sounds like I've really got something against Canadians here. <laughs> um, I think Canada is a wonderful country and um, with great people, um, apart from the people who work for Adventure Canada and drive cars in Nova Scotia. Um, uh, so this was terrible. I persuaded my poor, long-suffering family who, um, by the way, I occasionally take hitchhiking, but only when I've messed up the transport. Um, and um, uh, it was a cruise supposedly through Greenland to Baffin Island, ending up on the north coast of Quebec. And we kind of went to one or two places along the way that were in the brochure, and then about 50 places that weren't. And it was so badly handled. And you had, and maybe this is um, because Canadians are so nice, um, you, you had about 200 Canadian people on there who just said, OK, we'll just go with it. You know, we're, we're cool. And then you had a dozen foreigners, um, of various nationalities, American, British, German, who said, hang on, hang on, this isn't, no, but why are we doing this and we can't we have the holiday you told us we were going to have and all this stuff. It was awful. It was also horrendously expensive, like I think I worked out for the family. We were paying one pound a minute to have the worst <laughs> holiday ever. Um, second place, actually, a trip um, last, last year with um, to the eclipse in... Uh, the US with another well-known company, Intrepid, which was a disaster as well. So, um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm useless at holidays. Have you had some any terrible holidays? <laughs> but it tends to be the more I pay, the worse the experience is. Aww. So that's why I hitchhike. Um, I had a terrible trip to Fort Lauderdale. Um, How? Because it was organised, this is my own fault for going, but by a chain of shopping malls. And they put us up in this lovely apart hotel on the beach. They were, look, 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 there's the beach, there's the sea. <laughs> now we're going to spend eight hours in this shopping mall, and then tomorrow we're going to spend 12 hours in this other shopping mall that's slightly different. <laughs> and I was like, hmm, that, that's great. Really love this beachside location that we've got no time to go to the beach. But it was oh, really no. fun. And I'm, I don't really like shopping, so it was, it was a long was time to be around. All round not suited to you at all. No. And this is why Helen spends all her time in the office now, I'm pleased to say. <laughs> This is why Helen loves going on staycations, <laughs> just yeah, staying in the UK. I've actually just been writing a list here of all the places that I've had really terrible um, experiences in. Number one, Butlins in Skegness. Would, what? I know, I don't know why I went. I went for a 90s weekend. Um, Dane Bowers was playing. I won't go into that anymore. Um, I went on honeymoon to New Zealand during um, the second of a really terrible earthquake. A oh, couple of years ago, three years ago, and just woke up in the middle of the night with everything shaking, glasses of water, you know, oh. falling over, um, stuck in a lot of, you know, especially living in Asia, stuck in a, a lot of natural disasters. Oh, and then the right. next day, you know, all the, all the kind of shakes had, had finished and we were just getting a little aftershock. So I was like, right, I'm going to pour myself a lovely glass New Zealand wine, you know, Marlborough wine that we'd, that we'd bought on a kind of an earlier day. Poured a whole, full glass of wine about midday, another aftershock, and the whole thing fell over. It was awful. Um, I know. Um, other really. I, 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 is that classed as a first world problem? It is. I, I know. know. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was upset. It was my honeymoon, and it rained the entire time. Never go to New Zealand in. When did we go? November. It's like Scotland. Um, I went to probably the hottest place ever, Chongqing in central mm. Sichuan province in August. It was like an oven, 45 degrees. That was awful. I just have a knack of choosing really terrible places to go at bad times. Oh, so no. that's my own fault. Well, stay in the office longer. <laughs> um, uh, one more question there, yeah. and then if there's any, any other last-minute ones, then let's go. Ah, good, I've got the last one. Okay. Um, well, firstly, I'd like to echo your enthusiasm for hitchhiking. I used to have a copy of the Hitchhiker's Guide to Britain, I believe it was. Oh, yes. Hitchhiker's Should have brought it Britain. in to be yep. signed. Still available on Amazon, 79 pence. Bargain, I shall uh, get it and then update it personally. Uh, but no, it's been a long time since I've hitchhiked. Uh, practical question for you, really. Um, more about how you handle, or what is the best way to handle day-to-day -day spending when you're 
in faraway countries that don't use pounds or euros. I have a euro account in France, so that's nice and simple if I'm in the eurozone. But if I travel to some other place that doesn't use pounds or doesn't use euros, um, I have an account with Revolut. Right. I load that up and I use that. And that seems to be, in fact it is, I've checked, better than my euro account, better than my pounds account. Sometimes I just take large denomination uh, euro notes or dollar notes and then change them for cash on the spot at the best rate I can find. I wonder if you've got any general thoughts and ideas on what's the best trick to maximize your buck I, I, when you I travel? Think you've, you've just done it. Um, uh, uh, that was all great. Um, never change money at an airport, obviously, in the UK. Uh, never silly. ever, if you're getting anything which is classed as an exotic currency, even though it's just something like the Croatian Kuna, never ever change that in the UK at all. You're going to get a better rate even at Dubrovnik Airport than you will ever get here. Um, and, well, I think we're just becoming much more connected and so therefore you're probably going to need less and less cash. On my second visit to Russia, I was on a tram in Nizhny Novgorod, suddenly didn't have any change, but it didn't matter because they take contactless cards for a 26 ruble, that's about 30 pence, um, tram ride. And if you pay with a, the right credit card, so I've got Halifax Clarity, but Barclay Card Travel Visa is also good, um, then you don't pay any charges, you get a decent rate of exchange, and that sort of seems to work. Uh, don't take 5,000 rubles to Russia. Right. Oh, okay. And is that because you're a spy or a smuggler or both? Uh, right. Um, any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? This is your chance. Um, oh, there's one at the back. Yeah, here we are. Um, I will make this one the last one because I think there is still wine outside, which is frankly all, 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 all we... Uh, this is just a, a yes or no question. Um, I was recently in Vienna where I was quite happy to pay a very small tourist tax and I wonder whether you think we should have one in London too. Oh, good question. Is that for very small tourists? <laughs> or, uh, um, the, um, oh, well, look, if you're a tourist in London, in your, when you're paying for your hotel, when you're paying for your... McDonald's, sorry to say that, when you're paying for everything, you're paying 20% VAT, and I think that's probably quite enough, and I get very annoyed with all these little tourist taxes, particularly, in, I'm not sure how it worked in Vienna, um, it means nothing to me, um, but, uh, <laughs> so, uh, the, um, uh, in Italy, um, Belgium, where you're, you, you think you've paid in advance for your hotel, and they suddenly say, oh, we need seven and a half euros, you think, well, why didn't you tell me in the first place or take it? So, so I, th I think they're quite annoying and I would be against them. But on the other hand, if you're, if you're Bath or Edinburgh, you've got lots of tourists and they're going to be coming in and they're, particularly if they're American, they're used to extras on top of everything, then I can see the temptation of, of going for it. But um, they annoy me, but that might just be because I'm an old... Sorry? Yeah. It's tax, so. Well, anybody can tax you. In, in Greece, it is a national tax. In the Balearics, in uh, Spain, it's a regional tax. And in random Italian cities, uh, it, it's, it's just, yeah, how much can we, uh, can we, we take off these, these people? So uh, there we are. Where, where are you on tax? Apart from not being taxed not or just... to pay it, I think. Okay. <laughs> You know, on the same page. Not. <laughs> yeah. But, but that we, we could do, but I, th I think uh, uh, time is moving on. We could talk about differential pricing so that if you're, for example, um, Russian, you pay 20 pence to go to the Hermitage, whereas if you're um, a uh, foreigner, you pay 20 pounds. And whether that's fair or not, but who knows? Maybe we could discuss that over a drink. So very nice last question. <laughs> All your questions were great. All your questions were great. Thank you very much indeed for the shots. And I can't wait to talk to you afterwards, I hope. Thank you. Yep.